the way we go over an hour, a little part of it here. And I pray, Lord, that you would, what we do not see the detail of, that you would just increase our faith that you are always, always going to do the right thing. And I pray for those that are sick tonight. I ask you to watch over them. Bring them to a place of health again. We surrender their lives, their bodies into your hand uh, for healing. And thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. For a number of years, I have been convinced that the uh, forthcoming world government, there are going to be four, three of them have already come and gone. And I had heard for years that the fourth one was going to be the old Roman Empire is going to come back. We're talking about um, Western Europe. And I don't believe that at all and have not believed that for a good number of years. Europe is not coming back. Europe is imploding. And it is imploding under the weight of Islam. So that's not going to happen. What I think is going to happen, you remember in Daniel, Daniel in uh, the image, the, the multi-metallic colossus that he saw, it had the head, the shoulders, the belly, and the thigh, and the toes. You remember what, what the toes were made of? Clay and iron. They don't mix. Exactly, they do not mix. And so the final form of a dominant world government is going to be a not good mix, okay? And there are ten toes. So that tells us that there will be ten government districts that the world is going to be divided into. And there will be one head. There will be one church. There will be one state. There will be one penal code. There's going to be a universal or a pandemic form of government. It has been my position for a long time that the iron and the clay will be apostate Christianity and Islam. I have an article here. It's like seven pages long. This happened Monday, February the 25th. One world religion, Pope Francis signs historic covenant with Islam. You ought to read this. This is absolutely mind-boggling. Now, I only have this one copy. I can get you, if, if you want copies, we can, we can shoot copies. But it is, it's happening, folks. It is happening. Yeah, it's just, this is unreal. All right, now, speaking of Job, um, we're in chapters 36, we're going to do 36 and 37 tonight. And then next week, guess who finally speaks? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So in chapter 36, Elihu is winding down, right? And uh, I want you to imagine a large-scale military campaign. And during the course of this, this huge, huge military campaign, an order comes down from the commander-in-chief at the top to one of the local commanders. And this order will necessarily result in massive loss of life. And the commander-in-chief knows that. When the local commander gets the order, he also is aware that this is going to cost a lot of lives. However, as difficult as this order may be to carry out, it's the only way to end this campaign with success. It's the only way. Now, the company commander does not understand the totality of things. He sees his men. The commander-in-chief sees the overall picture, the overall movement of troops, and the overall strategy. The local commander sees what his little part of that is. The commander-in-chief has the authority to make this decision. The local commander does not. The commander-in-chief can see everything. The local commander does not. Well, this is kind of the situation we're looking at, specifically in the book of Job, but in chapters 36 and 37, 
This is a, a limited illustration to let you know that Elihu is going to make a final point. And that final point is this. We don't know how God governs the world. We don't know. We're local. We live here. We see just a little bit. We see just a few people every day. We drive just a few miles from home every day. We don't, we don't see the overall picture, but our commander-in-chief does. So not only does he have the wisdom to make decisions that we don't understand, he can see everything that we don't understand. And so Elihu is going to try to explain to Job, this is how God governs the world. Men do not understand it. And then, of course, he's going to lay this at Job's feet. You have complained now for many chapters. You're a local commander, and you're, you're complaining against all of the, the movement that's been going on in your life. You don't know what God knows. Now, that's true. You don't see what God sees. That is also true. And so his final speech is going to have two main muscle groups to it. And um, after a, a short introduction of, I'm nearly through, please be patient with me. That's, that's what Elihu's going to be saying here. Um, he's going to begin the main body of his speech. And, and the two muscle groups of what he's going to be talking about in 36 and 37. Number one, it's how God deals with people. Human beings. Righteous, unrighteous. It's, just, it's what God does in his interaction with people and that's in chapter 36 verses 5 through 25 so nearly the whole chapter deals with how God deals with people then in the second group he's going to show how God deals with the world and that's in chapter 36 verse 26 through chapter 37 verse 20 and so he's going to deal with people and then he's going to deal with the world and Elihu is going to surprise us with a pretty good knowledge of weather patterns and he's going, to, he's going to walk us through in chapter 37, four seasons. And he's going to explain weather patterns in that part of the world. And the, the end is going to be, we don't understand how this works. He's going to talk about lightning. I'm going to give you some information about lightning. We need lightning. We've got to have lightning in our world or we'd be in a bad, bad fix. Now, it can be a bad, bad thing. Somebody said lightning you know, doesn't strike twice in the same place. It usually doesn't have to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Once is enough. And um, so let's uh, begin verse number one. Now, Elihu proceeded and said, Suffer me a little, and I will show thee that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. Translation, directly from heaven. What I'm telling you is directly from God. Now, it very well could be. We, we, we don't, I'm not sure this is arrogance. Um, I think he thinks that he is being a prophet right now. And so he says, I will ascribe righteousness to my maker. And the word ascribe means to demonstrate or prove, And so in the next many verses, his, his point is to prove that God is majestic. God is mighty. God is powerful. And there's one thing that we can say about Elihu is this. He was a passionate warrior to defend God and the majesty of God and the power of God. And you don't mess with God. And you don't say bad things about God. You don't, you don't do that. He is a, a very passionate defender of that. Verse 4. For truly my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with thee. That may have a little taste of arrogance in it right there. Behold. God is mighty. This is what he's going to be talking about now for the next uh, number of verses here. God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. So we're talking about uh, God. He, he doesn't despise any. In essence, people do not, he's not prejudiced towards or against anybody. He doesn't use people as toys. 
This is not a, a big universal chess game that the Lord is playing chess with Satan. This is not what this is. All right? God is historically for the righteous, and he is historically against the unrighteous. Everything that God does, every move that he makes, is to bless the righteous. Everything. Even if, it do, even if our local command center here, that hurts. This is for your good. Man, that is just painful. This is for your good because we only see here, but God sees here. And so this is what this young man is defending. Verse 6, he preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. And the word right there, we're talking about he gives justice. And so he will not let a wicked man live indefinitely. He's going to cut him off. And the, the picture is that he will cut him off while he is enjoying his prosperity. It's not like toward the end of, a, of an old life and, you know, he's ready to go anyway. But as, he, you know, as he's climbing and as he's hitting his stride, boom. That's, that's what we're, we're looking at here in verse number uh, 6. Verse 7. He withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous. So Job has said on a number of occasions that the Lord has hid from him, right? Well, in essence, he has not. He's not hidden. He's watching Job. He is carefully watching Job. And by the way, God has not changed. He is carefully watching us. Now, not for the purpose of beating us if we do something wrong, but it's like a mother watching her child on the playground. You know, that mother's watching that child for the purpose of defense and protection and what make, making sure that the child is safe and secure. God watches us, and, and he's, he doesn't despise us. That's not why he's watching us. But he constantly watches and guards with his eyes. So he is absolutely determined to carry out his divine plan. Nothing can stop God's plan from being carried out in your life. And uh, so he's strong of heart, he says, and uh, gives the right or he gives justice to the poor. He doesn't withdraw his eye from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. So the righteous... Well, the righteous will be vindicated. The, and this is in life, by the way. The name of the righteous, though it might get dragged through the mud like Job is doing right now, before he dies, it will be proven that he was right all along and that he was not a sinful man. He, was not, he wasn't a thief. He didn't oppress the poor. He didn't do any of those things. And before he dies... He's going to be given a real good shower, cleaned up, and set back up on uh, the, the pedestal of leadership, not worship, but leadership. And people are going to say, ah, man, he was right all along. And these guys over here, can you imagine what the, what the general consensus is going to be of the community here at the landfill when, when all this is over and they all kind of turn their eyes and look at these four? You know? So, verse number 8 and if they be bound in fetters, now we're talking about the righteous, and at least he's honest enough to say, you know, there are times when the righteous do get in trouble. Now, the other three never admitted that. If you are unrighteous, you get in trouble. But now, he, he is even, he almost goes as far as to say, Job, you're right. You're righteous, but you're having trouble, but he never says that, all right? If they be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. So there is a redemptive suffering that Elihu is recognizing and confessing here. If you're a godly person and if you're walking with the Lord, if this is the way you live your life, then um, suffering is not for punishment, but for purification. It's to show you. It's to, it's to deal with some issues that are in your life. It, you're, you're being filtered for the purpose of being a better individual, all right? 
Verse number 10, he openeth also their ear to discipline. So in times of severe struggle in life, that's when you probably are going to listen more carefully to what God has to say. When we're prosperous and everything is just going great guns, we might not be as apt to listen. We might not be as apt to stop and pray and seek the voice of God. But, but when this happens to you, it, it, it begins to create this, um, what, what am I doing wrong? What's going on here? And so the ear is opened according to verse number 10. He commandeth that they return from iniquity. And so what, what is the purpose of the suffering for, of the righteous? He's telling, hey, yeah, yeah, stop doing what you're doing and come back. You know, I love you. I've got my eye on you. I'm watching you. Um, and, and so that, that is part of this, verse number 11. If, now there are going to be some um, two opposite illustrations here. The guy that listens and the guy that doesn't listen. All right, so let's look at the guy that listens. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Now, he almost goes back to this prosperity gospel stuff. You serve the Lord, you're going to be prosperous. Now, if we take this to mean that he's going to be blessed and his heart's going to be returned to a right relationship, then I'm on board with that. But this doesn't mean that your bank account's going to run over and your 401k is just going to explode. That's not what he's talking about here. So, look at verse 12. But if they obey not, what if the guy doesn't obey? Well, they shall perish by the sword, and they shall die without knowledge or without knowing whatever happened to them. Verse 13. But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath they cry not when he bindeth them um, there will be people who regardless of the suffering pain pressure hurt whatever they're just going to grit their teeth and say no I will not submit I will not surrender let me give you a perfect example of that look in Revelation chapter 16 16, 8. Revelation 16, 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. You talk about global warming. It's going to happen one day, all right? And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. So, can people be so crushed that it just absolutely hardens them to the point where they're just never going to repent, they're never going to acknowledge God? Well, apparently, apparently, because we've got the two books in the Bible that are the furthest apart chronologically than any other books in the Bible, Job, the first book, Revelation, the last book. And so you've got the same exact stuff going on in both books. Now, verse number 14. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. The phrase unclean there is a reference to male prostitutes in pagan temples. And here's the idea, that things don't go their way. They get mad at God. They get bitter at God. And so they turn to a life of sin. There's no reason to serve God. Look what happens. There, there's no reason to do the right thing, because when you do the right thing, look what happens. So I may as well just live my life. And so this is uh, according to verse number 14 now. Their life is among, they, they turn to that, the unclean. He delivereth the poor in his affliction and openeth their ears in oppression. And so God deals with people. However you handle your pain, your response determines God's response. What you do when you're under pressure determines what God does 
under your pressure. And what I mean by that is this. A person who says, no, I will not submit, it doesn't end. The pressure, the crushing, the loss, the diminishment, all of that continues. But to the person that says, I'm wrong, Lord, you're right, I confess this is sin, I'm turning from this, then the Lord takes that off of him. All right, so we're looking at that. Verse number 16. Even so, would he have removed thee out of the strait, and strait means narrow, remember broad is the way, and strait means narrow, and so he would have removed you out of this narrow place into a broad place where there is no straightness or narrowness, and that which should be set on thy table should be full of fatness. But look at you, Job. What is on your table right now? There should be turkey and dressing, and there should be ham, and he wasn't a Jew. Uh, you know, there, there should be all kinds, but look what, look what your table's full of, buddy. It's full of disease, and it's full of loss, and it's full of embarrassment. It's full of, look, what, look what's on your table. So apparently, what decision has Job made? Yeah, I ain't, no, 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 no. This is, this is the indication here. So, verse 18. Because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with his stroke, then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Now he's going to warn Job of three dangers. If Job doesn't make things right. And those three dangers are going to be, uh, in, in Elihu's understanding anyway, you could possibly try to buy your way out of this trouble. All right? Look at, uh, what was it, verse number, verses 18 and 19. Because there is wrath, because this is a current situation that you're in, Job, beware, be very careful now, lest he take thee away with his stroke, then a great ransom. You can't buy your way out of this. You can't bargain your way out of this. God doesn't have a shop steward. You're not going to negotiate a new contract. This is, this is not going to happen. So be careful not to think that you're going to be able to do this. All right? Verse number 19, will he esteem thy riches? Answer, no. No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. You cannot bribe, neither can you intimidate you can't bring your forces up to the throne of God and say, if you do not back off of me, you see what I got here? The Lord would laugh at that. Remember Aristotle Onassis? Married Jackie Bouvier Kennedy? He was a Greek shipping magnet, one of the wealthiest men in the world. He uh, developed an eye disease. The eyelid muscles deteriorated, and he couldn't hold his eyes open. Now, this multi-billionaire, you, know you know what the doctors did to him? They got scotch tape, and they taped this guy's eyes open. How much did he spend on scotch tape? You know, he's a multi-billionaire, and he went to Walmart to get scotch tape to hold his eyes open. God doesn't care who a person is. He doesn't care it doesn't care, he doesn't care about the, uh, the power, the political position. And I'm telling you, you know I'm preaching to the choir here. There are some people in this country right now that are sticking their middle finger to the heavens. Daring God to move. And it just, it makes a hair stand up on the back of my hand. When I see some of the things that we're doing and saying and legislating. I'm like, oh my word. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, you know. Yeah. Don't take his patience for inactivity, all right? 
God's just patient. He, he hasn't left. All right. Um, verse 20. Look at verse 20. Here's the second danger. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Job, don't get so discouraged that you commit suicide. Don't do that. Don't desire the night, which is talking about the grave. Don't do anything to yourself. And so he was, he was afraid that maybe Job would get so depressed and so discouraged he would do that. This happens all the time in our, in our country. You know, you know what age group is, it right now is the fastest growing number and ratio of suicides? Kids. Kids. You don't want 10, 11, 12-year-old kids committing suicide. Um, I was stunned and shocked a number of years ago when Robin Williams hung himself. Did you ever see what Robin Williams serious? Every interview, he had people in the aisles. I mean, I don't care what he was talking about. It was just funny. The guy was just, he was a funny guy. And you would think if somebody in the world did not have any problems or cares or difficult, it would be that guy. But he hung himself because he'd been dealing with depression for years, and that was the way he dealt with it. And so uh, he's just warning him, Job, don't get so discouraged that you're going to do anything silly to yourself. All right, look at number three. Look at verse 21. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. All right, here's the third warning that he gives him. Job, don't get so discouraged that you might not commit suicide, but that you just turn away from God and go live a life of sin, maybe become one of these male prostitutes. Don't do that either. So he's giving him these three warnings that you know, don't do this, don't try to buy your way out of this, you, you can't bargain your way out of it, don't commit suicide, and don't turn to a life of sin just because these things are happening and, and you're angry at God. So don't, don't do that. Now, verse 22. He comes to the end of his warnings, and his encouragement now is, Job, what I'd love to see you do, just get a fresh vision of the majesty of God. Just get overwhelmed with him. Look at verse 22. Behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? What kind of school? Have you, have you ever been to a school like, like God puts you through? God will teach you some things that you would not learn any other way. I mean, and these lessons are they're personal. Uh, when I was teaching here in our school system, I had to do a, I hate paperwork. Um, I love to teach, but the paperwork drove me nuts. We had to do a thing called an IEP. You know what that is? <laughs> an individual education plan. Uh, let's say I had 25 students in a classroom. You know what I had to do? I had to write an individual education plan for every child in that room for Lesson 23. Did y'all have to do that, Pat? You don't have to do IEPs. But no IEPs? Well, now I am ticked off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How are you going to teach this child that um, 4 times 4 is 16? You got a visual learner here. You got a verbal learner here. You got a no learner here. And you had to determine how you were going to approach each of those children with the same exact lesson. And so, but nobody teaches like God does, according to verse number 32. Now, or 22. 23. Who hath enjoined him his way? Who taught God how to teach? Or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity? Can we say, Lord, you did wrong? I've heard that. I've heard people say, he didn't have any right to do this. He had no right to take that person. He had no right to do this. I've, I've served him. I've been faithful. He had no right. God's got a right to do anything he wants to do. He is sovereign. He is the commander-in-chief. Now, honestly, do you like everything that's ever happened in your life? Been some things that, ever been anything happened in your life that made you mad? Ticked you off? You just... Spit cold ice water, you know. Um, do, you th do you think maybe that the commander-in-chief knew what he was doing? You think perhaps that, that that little painful intersection 
was something that was absolutely necessary in life. And so he's encouraging, just, just catch a new vision. So I want to encourage all of us tonight. I don't know what you're going through, but just catch a, uh, just a fresh vision of the majesty of God. We're, we're not alone. God has not walked out of the room and said, you know, I'm tired of fooling with you Americans. I've blessed you. 1776, I gave you the greatest constitution. I gave you, I gave, I gave you founders that were wise. I've given you a country that was based on individual freedoms. I am tired. And then y'all turn and you murder your babies after they're born. You have legalized homosexual marriage that I have said in my word is an abomination and offends me. And you have codified that in your laws now. I'm tired of y'all. He could do that. But I've got some good news. He has not done that. All right. So verse number 20, what, four? Remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. You can be, Job, you can be a, an absolute monument of the majesty of God. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Boy, there's a statement. God is great, and we don't know much about him. Now, he's, he's right about that, at least in my case. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. How old is God? He's not bound to time. There's, there's, there's no genesis of God. There's no beginning. of, And I don't honestly do not understand. How can something have always been? Timeless. Good, good word for it. Absolutely timeless. 600 trillion billion years ago, God was on his throne. I just, oh, wow. Oh, that's beyond me. For he maketh small the drops of water. Now, he's, he's going to change things, and he's going to walk us through the seasons and explain to us the majesty of God, the mystery of God, in dealing with things like the weather. Now, if God can manipulate earthly weather patterns, do you think he can take care of you? If he can move clouds... From Russia to China to Spain to the United States. If he can do that, I think he can handle the things that we deal with. All right. And so in uh, verse number 28, we are going to look at autumn. Uh, or 27. For he maketh small the drops of water. They pour down rain according to the vapor thereof which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. All right, now, after the blistering heat in this part of the world, uh, there, there was drought, and, and drought is terrible over in this part of the world. These autumn rains come, and it's absolutely a treasure. It's a liquid treasure to these people because they don't get it very often, but when they do, it is just it, it's a fantastic blessing to the to the whole culture and so we're in the autumn now and the vapor which is what a cloud is a cloud is gas it's, it's water vapor right and in this cloud there is dust and dust is a single particle of dust and it is so high and it is so cold that moisture collects on that single piece of dust, speck of dust in that cloud, and at God's go, all these drops, gentlemen, start your engines, go. And the rain falls. And it falls in, not torrents like pouring it out of a bucket, but in single individual, individual drops. Could you imagine if the Lord let it rain like somebody pouring out just a gallon, you know, a bucket of water, and he just, but, but he, he distills it. He breaks it up into little drops, which is brilliant, I think. So verse number 20, uh, 30, or 29. Also, can any understand the spreadings of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Now we're talking about thunder 
Uh, now, of course, in these days, they did not understand, you know, the principle of, of thunder. We know a little bit more about it now. Lightning um, is about an average width of a bolt of lightning is one quarter of an inch. And it will have anywhere from 30,000 to 100,000 amperes of electricity in it. This stuff is bad news. And um, we, we've got to have lightning. And what it does, it is so hot, it's about 57,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 10 times hotter than the sun. So this stuff is bad news, but it's also good news. And so as the lightning bolt rips its way through the heavens, it burns a hole in the air. That's how hot it is. And then as the air on either side of it is called a channel, the, the air comes back together to, to fill the channel. That's what you hear as thunder. And so you see lightning first, and then you hear the thunder second. Uh, now, lightning is, tell you what lightning does. Lightning, as it, as it burns its way through the atmosphere, the atmosphere is filled with nitrogen. Nitrogen is the third most copious element in the universe. However, it's tightly bound together. There are two, two atoms, or two molecules, rather, of nitrogen that have, uh, the bond is so tight, it's called a covalent bond. And you can't get them apart. There, there's nothing we can do to get it apart. Therefore, nitrogen that we need to live, by the way, we cannot use it in its unusable gaseous form as it's just hanging out in the atmosphere. And so the Lord has got to somehow break it apart. And guess what he uses to break apart? Nitrogen molecules. Lightning will bust those molecules apart. Then, as, they, as they're broken apart, they can be dissolved in water. Well, the rain takes the nitrogen that has been busted apart by lightning, and it drops it down to the ground, which we still can't use it until it is taken up in the roots of plants. And so when we, uh, when we eat greens and legumes or beans and peas, that's the only way, well, actually, that's one of two ways that you can get nitrogen, which you've got to have to survive. We've got to have nitrogen. And it, is, it forms nitrates in the air. And so, actually, you know who the, the, the lightning capital of the world used to be Ruskin, Ruskin, Florida. What was Ruskin famous for? Tomatoes. Ruskin tomatoes were the best in the world. And the reason was there was so much lightning over in that part of Florida that the nitrite, which is fertilizer, Keith sells it at his place of business. It would fall out of the air, hit the ground, enrich the ground, boom, and tomatoes would just jump out of the ground. And so we eat the plants that take the nitrogen that has been busted apart by the lightning. We eat the plants, and we eat the animals that eat the plants. And so those are two ways that you have, that the only two ways that we have of getting nitrogen into our system. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be able to survive without lightning. And so this guy has a pretty good uh, understanding, and, and he understands the need for electricity. And also, the earth is kind of like a battery. And on occasion, probably every night, you charge your phone battery. So the battery's got to be charged. And so the earth is negatively charged. Lightning is positively charged. And so when lightning hits the earth, it recharges it. And it is estimated that every year, lightning storms around the world release 100 million tons of nitrogen on the earth. Did God know what he was doing? This is absolutely incredible stuff. Now, we know more today about this stuff than Job and these guys did. But if, if you don't know the simplest of things that God does, in essence, what do you know about the really significant things that God does, you know? These are just simple things that God put together. All right? Now, uh, let's see. Verse, uh, what? 
Third, thank you, John. All right. Where, where, sir? All right. Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it, covereth the bottom of the sea. So lightning pops, rain fills up. For by them judgeth he the people. Ooh. So it was not just for nitrogen and recharging the earth and for food, but every now and then the Lord spanked somebody with weather. Hmm. Has that happened recently? You know, God uses the weather as a paddle, you know. He giveth meat in abundance. So why, why else does rain fall? Well, rain's got to fall so stuff can grow, so we can eat. So with clouds he covereth the light and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. The noise thereof showeth concerning it. The cattle also concerning the vapor. And so cattle benefit from the water cycle. And, and life itself benefits from this water cycle. And so um, now look at verse 37. At this also my heart trembled and is moved out of his place. Yeah, when you understand the works of God a little better, it do, it'll make you think, man, what was I thinking? To Stand up. And, you know, and try to challenge this God that can do this. Hear attentive, attentively the noise of his voice, that's the thunder, and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven, and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. You want to feel insignificant and scared to death. Stand outside in your yard during a really bad Florida electrical thunderstorm. I'm, I mean, you remember when Charlie came through here? Every day for what? Three weeks after Hurricane Charlie came through here? It clouded up, got black as midnight, and just the lightning popped. I was up on the roof on uh, the, excuse me, on, uh, yeah, it was on, the, on the ridge, and I was putting some tarp down, and it started Lightning popping. I just laid down on the roof and prayed, Lord, please don't kill me. Uh, it was just popping everywhere. Just scare you to death. And it gives you an idea. This is, um, this is a light thing to God. This is not even his heavy-duty work. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Now, he's personifying God's voice in the thunder. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Now, we're out of the, we're out of the autumn. Let's go to wintertime now. He saith through the snow. Right, now, this is, this is the real scientific, technical way God does this. Be thou on the earth. That's it. <laughs> Be thou on the earth. And so there's a, there's a point in this seasonal cycle where God's breath <sighs> freezes the great lakes and the rivers and the ponds and the, and the trees shiver to the point where their leaves fall. And the animals hide in their dens. And men come out of the fields. And they go in their house. And they light their fires. And we even today, it gets so bad at times. It did just a few weeks ago. So bad in, uh, up in the northwest, uh, central part of the country. It got, what, 40, 50, 60 below, uh, below zero. And they didn't even deliver mail. There were nine states that stopped mail delivery for, I don't know, a, a day or so. Uh, that's some pretty bad weather, all right? And, and so the Lord just went and froze everything. That, you want to mess with that God, really? Is this the God you want to stand up and question him? You don't know what you're doing. Really? Really? And, and next week when we get into the next chapter, uh, we're going to look at how God's finally going to stand up and say, hmm, might I have a turn now? <laughs> All right. So he says to the snow, be thou on the earth. Likewise to the small rain 
and to the great reign of his strength. He sealeth up the hand of every man. In other words, they don't go to work. It's so cold and inclement outside that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into their dens. It's so cold the bears go and they hibernate. The animals get out of it and remain in their places. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind and cold out of the north. Man, this is a teeth of winter, you know, like it is here in Florida. By the breath of God, frost is given. And the breadth of the waters is straightened. Made, it's it shrunk up, it's frozen, it contracts just with the breath of God. Also, by watering, he wearieth the thick cloud, he scattereth his bright cloud. And it is turned around about by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world in the earth. Weather waits for the master's instructions. The clouds are like where he wants to go. We've been assi- okay, we've been assigned to Wachula. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Some got assigned to Wachula today. And we were sitting in a restaurant, and phew, here it come. These drops rain. It rained, I don't know, what, 20 minutes, something like that. It had a good, good hard rain. And when the clouds finished, they were white. They, they dumped all the dirty water and moved on. They're, they're collecting, and they're going to rain on somebody else tomorrow. You know. So God is instructing. He's the great orchestra leader that orchestrates all things. And dare we question this great God? Might not understand it, but God never does wrong. He never, he never moves to hurt. He moves to heal, to bless, to build up those people <clears throat> that love him. Excuse me. All right, let's get down to... Where are we, John? 13. Thank you, sir. Turn this over to you. I can't even see. He causeth it to come, whether for correction. Hmm. So, is, is weather a corrective? Yes, it is. Or for his land? Is there time when uh, the land just needs water? This needs snow. Need yeah. How about just for mercy? Just these people were struggling, and it was dry, and he drops water on them, and, and it, they were burning up in the summertime. It is hot, and he he gives them some cool. Isn't it great? I, I love it when it's about sixty, sixty-five. That's a cold winter day to me, sixty or sixty-five, and. Um, it, <laughs> Hearken unto this, O Job, stand still, and consider the wonders of God. Dost thou know when God disposed them and caused the light of his cloud to shine? Job, do you understand all this, Job? Well, Job's got to say, no. Then what are you questioning? If you don't understand this, why are you questioning that is where he's going with this. Dost thou know the balancings of the clouds and the word balancing means poised they're they're like racehorses in the gate they're well they're prancing you know they're stomping and they're they're blowing and they're they want to run these clouds they want to get somewhere they want to do what they're designed to do and so he's got them poised ready to run and calls the light of his cloud to shine dost thou know that the balancings of the clouds the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge. Now it's going to be summertime. How thy garments are warm. When he quieteth the earth by the south wind. Now he's frozen everything with his breath. Now it's getting to be summertime. And he's going to blow another kind of breath now. It begins to melt. 
and the waters begin to crack and the ice begins to dissolve and, and the water now is, is liquid again and all the snow is gone and the trees begin to blossom and the birds. So you all know what happens in, in the summertime. And so you get hot in Florida and the humidity is, oh my word, you all know how bad it is in Florida. Um, it's, it, it's when it's 90 degrees and 90% humidity, it's just miserable. And I've been other places, and probably all of y'all have too, where it will be 90 degrees, but it'd be beautiful. I've been in Arizona and Texas when it was ridiculously hot temperature wise, but I didn't sweat a drop. We were in Whitefish, Montana. Got hot out there on that building permit or that building uh, project years ago. And it was hot. And we were up and down scaffolds and on the roof and da 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 da. I didn't sweat one time. I got home and walked to the mailbox and broke out in the sweat. John? It was evaporated. Is that what it was? I never saw it. Okay. I never saw it. But down here, I guess it, it's just too, it won't even evaporate. You know, it's just like, no, I ain't even going to fool with that. So <laughs> it doesn't even happen. All right. And so now, uh, verse uh, 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong, is a molten looking glass. It gets so hot, it's kind of like there's a, there's a brass lid and the sun just bouncing off that. You're in a frying pan. You're in the oven. And it gets so boiling hot that you're sweating in your clothes. And, and uh, verse 19, teach us what we shall say unto him. For we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. What are you going to say to God about anything he does? My speech is covered in darkness, which means I just, I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't have the words. I don't have the understanding. I, I can't charge God with anything but being good. And I don't understand. You don't have to understand God's goodness to believe it. You just, just by faith, you know God doesn't do wrong. Regardless of how painful it gets God does not do wrong verse number 20 shall it be told him that I speak Lord it's Job oh oh it's Job oh my goodness I better behave myself God doesn't do that if a man speaks surely he shall be swallowed up so Job if you can't understand God's natural government, how can you understand God's moral government? You can't. And now, men see not the bright light, that's the sun, which is in the clouds, but the wind passeth and cleanseth them. Fair weather cometh out of the north. With God is terrible majesty. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He's excellent in power. You will never know. Even in heaven, we will never know everything there is to know about God. That's how magnificent and mighty and powerful God is. He's excellent in power and in judgment. And in plenty of justice, he will not afflict. He will not. He's too good to be bad. He's too just to be unjust. He can't be these things. Men do therefore fear him. He respecteth not any that are wise of heart. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah. Right. So he's mystified by all of this. Well, uh, He's about to have his request answered. What has been Job's complaint through the whole book? I want to talk to you. Hey, I want to talk to you. I hear, yeah, right. You got some questions, you know. It's like, you remember Ricky used to say to uh, Lucy, you got some explaining to do. <laughs> well, Lord, you got some explaining to do. Well, that's, that's about to happen uh, he's about to get um, a personal audience. Yes, sir. 
we don't really know. But it's probably a few days. So we don't find any major, well, let's, let's knock off for the day and we'll start tomorrow. There, there just seems to be a continual run. So we're probably talking about just a few days. Jack, good question. Uh, now here, here are two questions. Is Job ready for this? Question number two. Are we ready for this? And next week in uh, chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job. Now look, look where his voice came from. Read, the Lord answered Job. Where? Out of the whirlwind. So as Elihu was explaining the clouds and the water and the da 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 and describing the lightning and the thunder, guess probably what was boiling on the horizon. This God was coming. And he's going to show up next week. And uh, so, all right, it's 8 o'clock. We've got to quit. Thank you all for being here. Y'all were a good, good crowd tonight. And I appreciate your presence. And uh, pardon? Yeah, you always, you always behave yourself, don't you? Uh, so we've got uh, chapter 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42, and we're done. Uh, has this seemed like a long series? Oh. <laughs> I right. It, it's taken a while. <laughs> I'm just kidding you. <laughs> So long, so long. I, <laughs> oh my goodness! But I do. I love book studies. I just, it, it, you, I don't think you can beat just. To, and, and it takes a while to get through this stuff. And I, anyway, thank y'all for being here. God bless you. See you Sunday morning, ten o'clock. Let's bow. Lord, we love you. We're we're mystified by the things you do. Lord, as the commander-in-chief, you see things we don't see. You are the governor of the world. And we bow tonight to worship you and to praise you. Thank you for being a God who not only chooses not to do wrong, but it is impossible for you to do wrong. Build our faith on that very truth. For the rest of our lives, may we trust you and fear you and worship you because of who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Y'all have a great